Hello, folks. This is House Corrections and Institutions, and um, we're going to shift gears again this morning, though we're always talking about corrections. Um, I thought it would be good before we get into S45, which is relating to discharge from probation. Um, I thought it would be good for the committee to have a probation 101 to figure out we did parole this morning parole if you remember is on the back end it's folks re-entering after an incarcerative sentence and it's through the parole board probation is on the front end of the criminal justice system probation is determined by the court but DOC does the supervision for folks who are on probation so we have Dale Crook with us today to go over uh, what probation is. And um, I'll turn it over to Dale. And then after that, we have Bryn coming in to give us a walkthrough of S45, which deals with probation. So Dale, welcome back. Your second time today. Uh, just for the record, uh, Dale Crook, I'm the Director of Field Services for the Vermont Department of Corrections. Um, I did was able to watch a little bit of the parole 101 today and 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 really for the department it's very similar with probation. Um, so as with parole with probation, the court is the appointed authority. Um, and what that means is that they are the dis deciding decision makers. So they determine uh, conditions, they determine what happens with a violation. Um, they determine if the probation is revoked. Um, the department supervises the case, the probationer for the court, and then makes recommendations up to the court uh, when they're found in violations or when we recommend discharge or modifications of probation. Um, th that's the, the main kind of crux. I mean, for the department, the appointed authority uh, with probation um, is the court's parole, is parole board, and with furlough, it's the department. Um, and they're really around the decision makers of what happens with that case. Um, as far as supervision goes, um, with the probation officers meeting with, with their probationers, um, it really depends on the risk level and how we're supervising them. So we have what is called, we have two big tiers of, of supervision for probationers. One is administrative uh, supervision, and that is in essence telephone monitoring is for our low risk offenders, um, where it's really around um, a probationer coming in and um, completing the tasks or the special conditions that were imposed by the court. Um, it could be something such as pay a fine, do some community service um, for whatever it is to satisfy that condition. Um, these are the cases that we spend very little energy on. Um, these are cases that we have larger caseloads and are really monitoring um, them to complete their tasks. Um, on the higher end of the cases, we have what is called risk management supervision. And that is the case where we are managing the risk. Um, these are for your more serious offenders, um, sex offenders, all sex offenders um, are in the risk management uh, category. Uh, domestic violence offenders begin in the risk management category. Um, we do have an assessment uh, when a probationer comes over from court that helps sort between administrative probation and risk management supervision. Um, the, the more serious the offense is, the most likely it will be in the risk management category. For example, murder automatically goes to risk management based on the severity of the offense. Um, so that's how we, we break down the supervision. On the risk management side, um, then we start looking at risk assessments uh, to determine the level of supervision or the frequency and intensity of supervision that's imposed upon the probationer um, as far as our contacts. What we can require a probationer to do is really based on the conditions of probation. So the conditions of probation is what drives the case as far as either success or um, a violation. Um, so that is how the department supervises. So we can't have a probationer do um, any activity that is not directed on a probation order. So we can't say you need to go do mental health counseling um, if we don't have a condition that directs the probationer to complete mental health counseling. Um, 
you know, there's other topics going on with probation right now as far as doing assessments and sitting conditions, um, uh, which really blends in well with this. Um, so I know this is part of S45, um, and that will be talked about later, but, but really the driving of those conditions and, and the, the offender completing those conditions is what determines um, how the department will end that case if, if allowed to. Um, so we can at any time the department, other than sex offenders, there's, there's some special language around sex offenders, for non-sex offender cases, the department can recommend a discharge at any time. Um, generally, we have criteria laid up um, for the administrative side is basically if you complete your conditions, we'll, we'll recommend. Um, that does not mean the court will um, accept that recommendation for a discharge or not. Uh, for the risk management side, we have uh, different criteria set based on the offense and risk. Um, so for domestic violence offenders, there is the ability for us to discharge, but they will have to complete um, all their conditions of supervision, have a period of supervision uh, without incident, uh, be determined uh, to have addressed their risk to the public. Uh, before we would look at doing a discharge of, of that nature. Um, I mean, I could sit here and probably talk uh, a long time about probation. I guess it's like, what what questions does the committee have uh, that might be able to better focus your interest and 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 your time? I, I so. So I have a question. I started asking and I was on mute. Um, who? You just talked about the risk management piece and the other part of probation and and the discharge. Yep. Who does the discharge from probation? Is it DOC or is it the court? So we make a recommendation. So the court is, is a decider. So this is the court's case in, in essence. That's what probation is. Probation is a sentence that has been suspended. Um, so if the probation it gets revoked, the offender could serve what that sentence is. But the judge and the court is the one that makes the determination. The state's attorneys will argue on one side for the state, the public defender will argue or the defense will argue on the other side as to guilt or not guilty. But it's really ultimately down to the judge that will make that determination. The department will make recommendations. So when we file a violation of probation, it's a recommendation and a notice to the court that a probationer has violated their conditions of probation, and we may or may not make a recommendation as to resolve that. It could be anywhere from a partial revocation, addition of, of, of uh, added conditions to help better supervise, or it could be a full revocation. As far as discharge, it's the same thing. We will indicate that the offender has completed the following conditions of supervision, um, and we would make a recommendation for discharge. And that's really, uh, and it goes off to the, 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 the originating court to make a determination. And that's where the state's attorneys and the defense attorneys may get involved to either argue, the state's attorneys could argue the discharge, they could accept the discharge, um, and then the courts would make the final determination. So it's all, <clears throat> it's all under the jurisdiction of the court in yep. terms of, of someone is released from probation or not. What is, what are you seeing? I got two more questions. What are you seeing for the average length of time that someone's on probation? Is it a two year probation? Is it 10 years, five years? Um, I, well, it, it depends. I do know there's caps for misdemeanors. I believe there's a cap for a two year, two year term. Um, and I think for a felony, it's a four year term. Mm -hmm. But there is the ability for the courts to go outside of those those time frames um, if they have justification. I think if the ends justifies the, the sentence, the courts do have the ability. Uh, for example, someone on for a very serious offense with a very long max, a 25 year max or a life max, uh, four years may not be appropriate. They may have, you know, until further order of the court, which there is no set term. Mm -hmm. So how many folks right now? Are on probation. Do you know? Uh, it's a oh, yeah. Um, not off the top of my head. I just had the numbers of a little over five. Five thousand. Five thousand under supervision. Um, I can get that. I can email that to you pretty quickly. I'm, I would not be surprised if someone's shooting me a text right now with that information. Hopefully. I think that's important for folks because when we say people who are under supervision 
of the Department of Corrections. At times, the numbers were as high as 12,000. They brought they were brought down to 10,000 and then about eight or 9,000. But the bulk of that are folks who are on probation. I, I believe rough numbers would be a, a little, I just heard the parole board say they had a, almost a thousand on parole. I think we have around 800, give or take, on furlough, and then 4,000, give or take, on probation. So the bulk of our community supervision is on probation, and about half of those cases are probably on administrative probation. Um, so um, our numbers have been in decline uh, for uh, the last 15 years. Um, a bunch of different reasons for that for probation. Some of it is uh, pretrial type activities and services. Um, and Monica's going to be sending me the numbers. So, how um, many folks? How many folks are on furlough? Was that around five hundred? Is that I think around eight hundred? Monica is Monica Weber um, is shooting me the numbers. She's watching on YouTube. Okay. Um, Just so people can put it in context, because I think everybody thinks that for folks who are under supervision of corrections, they think they're all incarcerated. And the incarcerated population is pretty small Correct. compared to what's out being supervised in the community. And I think people need to keep that in perspective here. Um, and, and another issue that we come across is our authority is really driven by the conditions that are imposed. So we a lot of times we'll get complaints saying, so-and-so probationer is doing X, Y, and Z. Um, and I don't want him to do that. He's creating noise, causing problems, drinking. And we may not have the authority or the ability to respond to that because we don't have conditions prohibiting that activity. So that does, so sometimes um, the general public may not understand. It's really driven by the conditions from the court about how we can respond to behaviors. And also to lead in, and, and I know we've got a question here, but also to expand on that a little bit as legislators, you'll hear from constituents, well, so-and-so is, is under corrections and what are they doing out in the community and they're violating this. The first thing you need to ask, what's their status? Is it probation, is it furlough, or is it parole? Because everyone thinks in the public that they're under these one, one status, whatever it might be. And there are different conditions that are set for the different statuses based on the risks and also who has um, jurisdiction, where probation's the court, furlough is corrections, parole is the parole board. And everyone thinks that it's um, furlough, everyone thinks it's corrections. I've got somebody at the door, so Karen. Yes, hi Dale, thanks for being here. Um, and I appreciate the comparison to parole since we just heard that. So it's easy to kind of put them side by side. And um, so I can see how their similarity in folks um, have the status and then they're monitored, you know, if they can maintain it or not. Um, I guess for me in hearing it, like for folks with parole in order to maintain or get to that status, they need to meet certain criteria, but they're within a fixed setting of being incarcerated where there's kind of a guarantee that programming is gonna be available, um, different offerings, supports are going to be available in the facility so they can meet those. I am curious if our communities across Vermont have that same um, equal access. Um, is all of the state covered well with programming, supports, opportunities? So somebody who's on probation in, I don't know, some town here, is it kind of different for them to be able to maintain their probation status versus in another area of the state that might not have the same supports and programming? I'm wondering if you could speak to that. So uh, oh, can I interrupt just one second, Dale? Yes. Here, can you take over? I've got someone at the door that I have to take care of for a little bit. Yep. Okay, thanks. So um, we, we do have a rural state and there are um, some areas of the state such as Burlington that have much more offerings as far as services available. Um, every, every, every district uh, office we have has a designated agency in their district. 
Um, and it really determines on what is the capacity that, that they had to offer the different services. Um, and generally speaking, most sites will have uh, access or are working on access to sex offender treatment, will have access to uh, domestic violence education or batteries intervention program. Um, one thing that we are, are starting to explore now with our departmental uh, risk reduction programs is tele, I think they call it telemedicine, but uh, teletreatment where um, as we're not having in person, we are we are working um, not just the department, other other providers with, with uh, a virtual sitting uh, as far as delivering services. Um, you know, that is that 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 could be beneficial as things start opening up. And um, what that does, it allows smaller, more rural counties to, to offer more more services. Um, uh, just the fact that, you know, we try to specialize in, in the treatment that we have. And a lot of that's based on numbers. Uh, so sometimes it's hard to have a woman's program in, in Newport or a very small county because we just don't have the numbers as opposed to Burlington, which may have the numbers to, to, to accommodate a group. Um, so we have two, two kind of kind of sections of, of services. One is departmental, um, and it depends if those probation conditions address us to do those specific risk reduction programs, um, or there's also the community providers. And, and those are gonna be um, at different levels across the state, depending on on, uh, on their ability to meet the needs. So the, so there is a disparity between the, the areas. Um, Thank you so. for sharing that. And it's also mm -hmm. helpful to hear that you are doing some things to you know address it. And I just think that's something for us as a committee to be aware of too. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks, um, Karen. Um, Kurt, you had your hand up. Yep. Um, Yes, I understand that uh, the probationer is supervised by DOC, but the decisions are, or the big decisions are made by the courts. At what point, or is there a point where the probationer is under the care and custody of DOC or not? So um, a probation a sentence can be partially suspended. So for example, someone has a two to 10 year sentence um, it's all suspended, but one year. That suspended part that all but one year will be served in a correctional facility. So they would serve one year in a facility and then come out to probation. So they would be released onto probation, not on furlough. And then they would have the remainder of that probated sentence uh, to serve. So the two to 10 would in essence be a one to nine as you already would have a year of credit for the time served in the facility. But so that person would be under the custody of DOC for the 10 years. Yes, while they're on probation, they'd be under the, the supervision of the department. A person, okay, um, a person who comes straight from court to probation is also under the custody of DOC. Correct. Okay. All right, uh, another a question on the community services and the, the risk reduction programs. Are they, are there wait lists now for those or are they adequately staffed such that you can get people into those if, if they do exist or um, not? The, the COVID, COVID situations have kind of impacted that. And so I'll try to speak in a non-COVID way, if that's, that makes <laughs> sense, because everything has been kind of thrown out, out, the, out the window right now with, with COVID, everyone's trying to manage the best they can. Um, one of the, the pushes from our commissioner, Commissioner Baker has been that there has not been the adequate level of services in the community provided to address the needs of our population. Um, you, you know, I can give you examples. There are services out there, but a lot of times they're either not um, focused or are geared toward dealing with people that are criminally justice involved. Um, they may or may not be uh, best situated to deal with mental health, personality disorders, uh, situations of that, of that nature. There could be a capacity issue um, where they, they cannot get enough providers uh, in, a, in a certain area. This is generally speaking across the state. 
Um, you know, for example, we don't have any long-term residential treatment facilities um, as some other states do. So, so one of our biggest pushes to the justice reinvestment, and I think uh, CSG has also kind of indicated this as well, is that, that we're kind of lacking some of the capacity um, out in the community. And do you uh, have any suggestions on the solution to that? Is that, is that a question of money or is it a question of uh, labor or what can we do to fix that? Well, I think justice reinvestment is, is, is starting um, the, the state down that path. Um, there are a series of trainings and recommendations uh, from CSG as far as uh, networking better with the community providers, uh, better assessments uh, for the population that we serve uh, to, to hook them up in better uh, situations out in the community. Um, part of it is, is probably going to be a resource issue where um, we need to expand the capacity of, of our designated agencies and other services and treatment providers out in the community to better match the needs of our population. Um, you know, and generally our risk management population, uh, um, we have very high needs individuals. Some of them are high risk, but the risk is really um, not, not the situation. It's the needs that need to be addressed. Everything from housing to mental health, to substance abuse, to uh, medically assisted treatments, uh, and to other, you know, cognitive behavioral uh, treatments to address their, their criminal thinking and behaviors. Um, I don't think there's an easy solution and, and certain things have impacted that over, over time um, where, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm not exactly sure the, how the designated agencies um, hire and retain staff. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough work, uh, you know, and, and not everyone is, is situated to, to work in this, in this environment. Um, so I, I think there's a lot, uh, I don't think there's an easy answer to this. Um, you know, I don't think just throwing money at it is always gonna work, but, but I think there is a resource need. Um, I don't, you know, it's, there's a few things out there. I think there's a lot of different things. I think CSG has done a pretty good job of kind of identifying some of them. I think the justice uh, reinvestment legislation is kind of leading us down, down that way. Um, we have a series of trainings for the department staff, for some of our, for our community providers we're looking at as far as some of our investments. Um, we'll be working with um, local providers to see how to match, match the needs of our population. Um, so. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm really interested in the, in the community supports, but that's kind of not probation 101. So we can, we can get into that some other time, but thanks. <laughs> So um, I know Alice is back, but I have a question. <laughs> so, this morning, um, it's nothing, this morning it, it's uh, when it rains, it pours, right? <laughs> so I had a question, Dale, it's kind of to follow up on something that rep questions that Representative Dolan and Representative Taylor had. You know, we, it's um, the work that the working group within the, 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 that's been working with the council and state governments has really been Map, map, you know, has identified the geographic disparities um, around these services. And I'm just so glad to hear your active involvement in that. And do you know when the next report is, is scheduled to come out? I'm just wondering. Um, and the council of state governments? Yeah, just with that working group, because to, you know, what, what I think you're hearing in the committee that there is, we see the connection between, you know, a the success of people on probation, you know, is linked to the the supports and services in the community that can support that work. So, um, I think they are kind of inextricably linked. Um, so, I'm just curious when that next report is coming out. I am not sure, but I do believe that uh, CSG is on later today. Um, okay, that's right. So you yeah. could probably directly ask them. I do. I I think we do have the the big group will have meetings, additional meetings. I don't know, I can't remember when um, the JRI, JRI team is meeting again. Yeah, you know, it's been, they've been that group, your group has been doing really great work. Um, Thank this. you. 
Um, and uh, Madam Chair, I do have the numbers, uh, uh, Monica. So on furlough, we have about 549 individuals on furlough right now. Um, parole, we have 899. We have 2,900 individuals on probation. Uh, so the total field count is 5,348. And that includes uh, about 577 uh, that are on work crew, um, which is kind of stagnant right now because with COVID, we have closed down our, our work crew programs at this time. Um, and, and then we also have a couple of hundred um, interstate compact cases, either out or in. Um, so those are a little harder to track for us how we, how we have it set up. Um, those are the numbers and, and they have really have diminished um, greatly over the past year but 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 also over the past 15 years there's been a, a steady decline um, um, you know we were at 12,000 12,000 individuals under community supervision about 15 years ago give or take um, and and through other activities through legislation and changes and processes and uh, you know, reparative boards taking direct referrals. A lot of cases have been deflected from the department, uh, very appropriately have been deflected from the department. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, the more serious cases don't get deflected in those ways. So you've seen a lot of our shrinkage with, with the department and the population on really on those less severe cases that can be managed without um, having them come into the supervision of the Department of Corrections, where our community justice centers can, can deal with them, or reparative boards and other activities um, that really deflect them, diversion that deflects these cases coming to the department. Um, so really the, the number that we have, you know, the 5,000 or so individuals, um, we would have had them 15 years ago, but we'd have another 5,000 uh, more lower risk cases involved with this. So really, so, um, you know, the, the harder cases haven't really gone away, uh, so to speak. So one thing that we did a lot of conversations about a number of years ago, Dale, was really looking at folks who are very low risk. Um, and the, the um, testimony that we always were receiving that the longer a person stays within the control of corrections or probation with the courts, if they're a low risk, you're really in the long run doing more damage uh, to them because they're constantly under supervision. Is, has that, is that really true? I mean, is that what you've seen in the world? Ab absolutely. For, so a low risk offender, um, Talking about reoffending doesn't mean it's the appropriate decision because there's victims and there's other impacts in, in, in those decision making and deterrence factors. But as far as recidivism, low risk offenders, um, for the most part, the department will probably make worse uh, because they will be interacting with higher risk individuals. You take a low risk individual and you put them in jail, surrounded by a lot of high risk individuals. Um, peer pressure and peer support is, is a real thing. And, and um, we would only increase their risk. Um, it's, 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 you know, our department, in my opinion, we should be focusing on the moderate risks and above where we can really make an impact in someone's behavior. Doesn't mean we don't supervise, you know, someone, you know, there's a lot of people on for really serious offenses that are low risk and that need to be supervised and monitored and held accountable. So I'm not saying that, but as far as, as dealing with low risk individuals, um, uh, the, the department may not always be giving you the best outcomes. And I do know we've had, historically we've had, had done studies on that. Um, I do know like, for example, for the low risk, our reparative board has had tremendous success in diverting these cases from the department and, and had better outcomes going through the reparative process than through the, the traditional probation process. Um, there have been studies from other states where um, they don't even supervise low risk offenders um, unless they're on for a listed, not a listed, but a, a sex offense or a domestic violence offense, they won't even supervise them on probation. Um, so, so there's a lot of evidence and research out there, and I think CSG has done a good, a good job of trying to bring some of that forward uh, as to as to really the impact um, that 
that supervising low risk offenders can do. Um, that's kind of essence why we have an administrative supervision is for those low risk offenders, those low severity offenders. Um, you know, most of them have jobs. Most of them are able to go out and do things. They don't need to, to come in and see a PO and possibly miss a day of work. They don't need to, to do other certain things. We can monitor them remotely. Um, and, and we have really good outcomes with, with those low risk offenders because they'd be successful anyway. You know, an example would be we take anyone on, on this committee meeting right now, if something, God forbid, something happened and you got in trouble, um, there's not a lot that the department is probably going to, most people I would assume are going to be low risk with, with minimal issues. Um, putting you in heavy structured environments is, may, may or may not change that behavior. Um, you know, so. so. So for some folks, throwing the book at them may make it worse. It, it will make it, well, I mean, the evidence has laid out that, that it will make individuals, it will reduce their risk to reoffend. Um, okay. Yeah, so we have some couple more questions, Kurt and then Scott. Yeah, I'm um, wondering if you could just give a, a couple of quick examples going from um, what would be what you would do on minimum, the very minimal supervision for the lowest risk up to the high ones. How, what's the difference in the supervision, the actual behavior of the, the person who's supervising? Um, I can tell you about the supervision. So for a, the administrative supervision, we use an automated telephone monitoring system where they check in once a month through an automated process. Um, and it's really, it's, it's, it's set up where it, um, the offender calls up and basically answers questions. Have you done, have you paid your fines today? Have you completed this assessment? And then they send in the documentation where you verify that. Um, those are for heavy caseloads doesn't mean that they don't reoffend and pick up new charges and things of that nature. So it's really hard to, to kind of categorize their behaviors. But um, is that a is that an auto is that an automated thing? It's a it's a or are they actually speaking with a person when they're calling it's, it's, in? No, it's, it's telephone monitoring. Um, it's to an automated system where they call in at a certain time um, and they answer um, some questions that are pre-programmed into the system. Um, it's designed to, to manage large caseloads. Um, such as this, uh, we have a very high call in rate. I mean, it's, it's like in the 90% call in rate, which, which is, I think is absolutely amazing that we have our population uh, calling in at a very high rate, like it's in a 90 percentile. I mean, I don't think I make 90% of my meetings on time. So, I mean, that's, so that's really good. Right. Um, and, and it, and it addresses them, um, you know, a lot of the evidence is, is you apply your resources and your energies into those that are the highest risk and the most and the most risky. Um, and that's what we do. Um, for someone that is at our highest level of supervision, we may or may not have them on electronic monitoring. We may or may not have them on an alcohol monitoring system. We will have field checks at their residence. Um, we will see them weekly. We will have just more, more intense and frequent contact with them. Um, and, and so that's kind of the spectrum. So your higher your risk, the more attention you get from the department. Um, and that's what the evidence tells us how we should, how we should address it. And, and, and by activities, it's not necessarily just pure supervision. It's, it's you put them in, in the right programming, you, you, you focus your resources on, on that population to address the behavior. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, also, can you give me a rough idea of how many people a field officer is managing? So we do have caseload caps uh, set in statute. Um, and they range from, for the administrative, it's, it's kind of this, um, it's not really a set number. It's as much as administrative system can handle. We have that around, give or take 300 uh, uh, around the cap. Uh, that depends. We have a lot of flexibility with that. Um, when you get over to the risk management side, uh, for youthful offenders or for individuals that are 25 and under, is capped at 25, 23 and under, is capped at 25 to 1. For listed offenders, which are your sex offenders and domestic violence offenders and anyone convicted of a listed offense, it is 45 to 1. For a non-listed risk management caseload, it's 60 to 1. Uh, we try to keep our caseloads um, under the 45 to 1. 
uh, just because the caseloads are set up in a way that in a lot of times the non-listed population can be the most intense needed. They, they, could, they could be your substance abuse and the very, uh, you know, uh, high needs group. And, and, and just because they're not on for a non-listed, the energy needed to supervise them um, can be a lot higher. So generally most of our caseloads are, are under the 45 to one cap for the risk management population. Good, thank you. Well, Scott? Um, thanks. Um, so uh, you said earlier that DOC prefers not to manage um, uh, the low risk people, but, but, but administrative management, is, is it, that's what that is, right? Is that, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Correct, so administrative supervision is really um, the, the focus of that is the completion of the probation conditions that have been assigned by the court. Um, so there's not uh, a lot of case management involved. We don't do a lot of higher level assessments with them. Um, they get screened and they'll have a handful of conditions. Um, they're generally on for, for low end property crimes, not low end. I mean, there might be property crimes or some other um, Nonviolent offense, such of that nature, and and then we would address it um, either whatever the conditions are set by the court, and and that's what the focus is on. When someone is in the risk management side, we focus on case management, and and with conditions allowing, address the behaviors and the risks that put the individual under our custody to begin with. That's that, that's a big difference. That's why it's important for probation conditions to best address the the needs of the of the population. Um, and, and that way, um, we, we can focus our attention to, to behavioral change uh, much more um, driven in that way instead of just condition completion. Behavioral change being with the medium and the high risk groups. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and you, then you also uh, seem to be making a distinction between low risk and, and, and low severity or, or of, of, the, of the offense. Correct. So can you talk about that a little bit more? So, so risk scores. So we, we do risk assessments, which are actual tables, which would indicate that someone with the similar scoring would reoffend at a certain rate. So high risk generally would have someone that would have substance abuse issues, may have unstable living environments, uh, bad social economic uh, friends, uh, negative attitudes and beliefs. So, so those, so the risk scores are really driven to um, the, the, that set categories uh, probability of reoffending. So someone that is high risk or very high risk could be in the 70, 80, 90 percentile to reoffend. Um, so that is reoffense is around risk. It also drives the need. So a high risk most likely would have high needs and certain uh, domain areas of those risk assessments, mental health, substance abuse, housing, et cetera, uh, that would be addressed through uh, services to, to reduce that risk of the individual. Severity is the impact is, is the offense. For example, um, a bad check is a very low severity offense. Homicide is a very high severity. So we, you know, as far as our, our um, supervision level assessment that we do for probationers determine if they go to risk management or, or, or administrative supervision, offense severity has a huge component to play on that. And there are just certain offenses that no matter how low your risk is, you go to risk management. Um, you know, there are some, there are some crimes that are kind of in the middle that have a moderate severity, but if the individual is very low risk, we don't need to supervise them with all the resources. We can address that behavior through the administrative supervision. Um, so it's kind of a scale between the two as determines where we slot them as far as kind of what bucket we put them in as far as risk management or administrative supervision. So it's a combination of risk and a combination of severity. Um, okay, that, that helps. So it's po possible that somebody would be, their, their offense would be a bad check but um, the likelihood of them of, the, of them doing it again is about 100 percent, and you'd be careful with that person somehow. 
<laughs> it depends how they, we do have some uh, ability for over and under ride. Um, for, sorry, say that again. We do have some ability with our assessments for an over to underwrite. So someone that may be on for a bad check, but the last five times we supervise them, they have ended ended with new reoffenses or something like that. We could move them into risk management. Okay. Um, it's really about trying. You know, the, the goal with those sorters and those screens is to to make sure that we are applying the right level of intensity to the case that's appropriate. Okay, great. Thank you. And I think that's also true when you become looking at incarceration. And this low risk to reoffend, low severity of crime, moderate risk to reoffend, high severity of crime, all of those different gradients was <clears throat> all being looked at and started to be put in place back in the late 90s under Commissioner Gorchuk. And we were incarcerating a lot of folks, taking up a hard bed at at that time it was like 30, 40,000 a year for low risk, low severity of crimes. They were taken up a hard bed. And Commissioner Gorchuk at that time said, those folks should be repairing the harm back home in the community. They should not be taken up a hard bed. The hard beds should be taken up with those folks who have moderate risk, high severity of crime, high risk, high severity of crime. Those are the folks who really should be taking up a hard bed. The other folks, let's deal with them in a separate way so it's more restorative and more um, re repairing the harm that was created back in the community. So those initiatives and that shift really started in the late 90s. And that's why now for folks who are incarcerated, we're dealing with the toughest cases. Um, we're not dealing with those light DUI cases, so DUI 1 or DUI 2. We're not dealing with those who are incarcerated now. As some folks from DOC said last year, it's going to take a lot for somebody to become incarcerated. And I don't remember who said that within DOC, but that was the testimony we received last year. So that's some of the history here in terms of what's happened within our correctional facilities. And Dale, you've been here for a lot of that. For that. Well, 12 years now I've been in this position. Right. So uh, Kurt has a question. I have to scoot out because I'm due for my second shot today at 10 of 12. So I have to scoot out. Uh, so Kurt has a question. We just had Bryn come on. Bryn is going to give us a walkthrough of S45, which is very similar in a way to earn time, sort of. For folks who are on probation, is there an opportunity, if they're really doing well on probation, to um, allow them to shorten their term on probation if they're complying with all the requirements. And this is a follow-up from last year for the folks in our committee. We did a lot of work on this and then we had <clears throat> council of state governments um, weigh in on it. And this is S45 as a result of that work. So I'm gonna shift it over to Sarah. Okay. Kurt, you have a question and I will see you all on the floor at quarter after one. Um, and then we'll go from there with our, the floor amendments. Okay. okay. Thanks, Alice. And we'll, we're just gonna do the walkthrough and we'll be getting into it deeper afterward, come yes. off the floor with the folks from the council and state government. So, yes, okay. Walkthrough of S45 and Dale would be helpful if you could also stay on just in case, it'd be great. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So go ahead, Kurt, you, you, what? You, you had your hand <laughs> oh. up, sorry. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, what you've described this, um, the, using the risk of reoffending and the severity of the offense to kind of determine the level of supervision, you've kind of spoken to that with regard to probation. Is it mirrored in parole and furlough? Is that all work pretty much the same? So with Justice Free Investment, the, uh, January of this year, we've changed our supervision practices. Uh, to be more geared based on risk and less on legal status. So um, um, we, we have supervision levels and risk management one through four. 
Um, so a level four individual will be supervised the same regardless of their legal status. So a furloughee, a probationer, and a parolee would be supervised at the same intensity. We used to, we used to separate with um, legal statuses. A uh, furlough is at a higher level, uh, but based on some of the recommendations and, and working with, with uh, councils of state government and, and making determinations and making decisions that would impact on justice reinvestment, um, we made it more of a risk-based um, how we apply our intensity. We're trying to make the legal statuses less of a variable on how the department supervises. Okay, good, thank you. Well, Dale, thank you so much. Um, I think I don't see any more questions and I think our friend here, our uh, legal counsel is here. So if you can stick around, if you are able to, we'd love to keep you in the room, but if not, we understand if you have other things to go. So I think we're gonna shift gears here and Bryn, great to have you here. Um, and I think what we're here now we're going to do a little walkthrough of um, S45. Um, and have you sent this to us or are you thinking that you'll share it on the screen? What is your preferred method? So it should be posted on your committee information page, but I'm happy to share my screen. Um, that's what I typically do in this committee. Yep. So glad to do I think it. That's a good idea. Helpful. Okay. Yeah. So I'll turn it over to you and we'll, we'll let you do the walk. How do you want to do it? Do you want to walk through the whole thing or take questions along the way? What's your... I'm happy to do and here at the committee's pleasure. So however you'd like to handle it is fine with me. Okay, so why don't we do this? Like if people have questions, raise their hand, but I think it's helpful to let Bryn get through the draft uh, or the, 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 the language and, um, and we'll let you take it from here. How's it sound? Okay, sounds good. So good morning committee for the record. Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see the bill. Let me know if that works. And yes, we can see it. And usually I zoom in a little bit to, so people can see it better. Is that, is that better? Okay. That's great, thanks. Okay, so um, the chair introduced this bill a little bit. Um, I'll just say a, a few more words about that. Um, the, the members of the committee who were on uh, this committee last year will remember that this was a, originally a part of the Justice Reinvestment uh, 2 bill. Um, you heard a lot of testimony about this, um, this particular idea. So in 2019, the Justice Center recommended that Vermont reform its uh, probation discharge process as a part of that Justice Reinvestment 2 bill. Um, and really what happened was the stakeholders couldn't come to an agreement about how to move forward with a policy for early discharge from um, probation if probationers didn't pose a risk to the public. So this, the policy that's set out in S45 really reflects um, a compromise that was reached by the stakeholders for a process to presumptively release probationers at the midpoint of their probation term if they don't pose a risk to the community or to the victim and if they're compliant with their programming that has to do with risk reduction and rehabilitation that's required as a part of their conditions of probation. So um, that's just a preface. I'm gonna jump right into the bill now. Uh, section one sets out a new uh, purpose of probation section at the beginning of the probation chapter that really puts forward the policy of the state of Vermont with respect to probation. So it provides that the purpose is to rehabilitate offenders, reduce the risk that they're going to commit a subsequent offense and to protect the victim and the community. So that's pretty straightforward policy language there. Um, and now the next two sections of the bill really get into how the policy is implemented. And I'm going to do something a little strange, which is that I'm going to jump from section two to three um, and then I'm going to come back to section two. Because what section two does is that it talks about um, how the court has to respond when DOC files a motion to discharge a probationer early. And section three deals with how the Department of Corrections is supposed to make that decision. So they kind of happen um, in reverse order chronologically. So I think it'll make more sense to the committee if I talk about section three first. Hopefully that doesn't confuse anybody too much. So I'm just gonna scroll down to section three. So this is the section of law that requires the commissioner of corrections 
to review the record of every probationer that's serving a specified term of probation during the month prior um, to the midpoint of that probationer's term. Um, if, if the probationer meets the criteria, and I'm going to scroll down to where the criteria are. So here we are, review and recommendation for discharge. So this is existing law that says commissioner has to review these records um, the month prior to the midpoint. And current law says that they may file a motion requesting the sentencing court to dismiss. So the change here is that they still have to make that uh, midpoint review the month prior to the probationer's midpoint, but now they shall file a motion. If the probationer meets the criteria that are set out in these subsections A through C below. So if the, if the probationer meets these criteria, the commissioner has to file a motion requesting that the court discharge the remainder of the probation term at the midpoint. So subsection A, and these are the conditions that um, if, if a probationer is to be eligible for a midpoint discharge, they must meet these three criteria. The first one is that the person has not been found to have violated a condition of their probation um, within the previous six months. So they can't have been adjudicated as violating their conditions in the six months prior to the midpoint review. B, the person cannot be serving a sentence for a certain set of specific crimes. Those crimes include sexual assault, domestic assault, or lewd and lascivious conduct with a child. So those are the three categories of offenses for which a person cannot be eligible for early discharge from probation. And then finally, sub C, the person has to have completed any risk reduction um, or rehabilitative services, the duration of which are set and knowable at the outset of probation and that they're required as a condition of probation. So this um, specific language was talked about quite a bit in the Senate. And the idea here is that, um, and I'm sure that Dale can jump in if he wants to, but there's all kinds of um, conditions that are placed on a person that may be ongoing. So for example, like drug treatment, um, AA meetings, attending AA meetings or something, that could be an ongoing requirement um, that could be seen as rehabilitative. But the idea here is that any um, finite duration uh, services that are assigned and required as a part of the person's probation at the outset of probation um, have to be completed in order for a person to be considered uh, for a midpoint discharge. I hope that's, hope that's clear. Nope, I have a question on that. I don't know. Did, oh, you wanted to wait till we go all the way through it? Oh, go ahead, Kurt. Why don't you ask the question? Um, can the conditions of probation change such that there would be new conditions added after the initial time that they were uh, set and knowable? This is probably a question for uh, Mr. Crook. They can be modified. Uh, the court can modify conditions after they originally have been set, uh, but generally will take some type of action for that to happen. For example, a violation of probation could result in an amendment of the conditions of supervision. The court sets those conditions, so they would have to go back to court in order for them to change. And so, but that doesn't cause a problem with this paragraph when it says set and knowable at the outset of probation? I do, do not see? believe so because I believe what would happen after violation, they would reset the term of supervision. Ah, okay. Or they, or they could reset the term of supervision. Okay. Okay, I think, I know we're gonna come back and revisit a, a good amount of this, but. But Kurt, did you have your question answered for now? Yeah, yes, okay. I'm fine. Thank okay. you. All right. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. Mm -hmm. So um, the next subdivision is um, D2. And this language here provides that if, um, this, is, this sets out what happens if the person doesn't meet those criteria or if the court um, declines the person for an early discharge. And we'll get to that part when we, get, when we go back to section two. So if those criteria aren't met or if the court denies that motion to discharge that's filed by the department, 
then uh, commissioner has to file a motion requesting the same thing that the sentencing court discharge the person or discharge the probation term once the probationer does meet the criteria set out in, um, in subdivision one that we just went through. And then lastly, in this section, subdivision three, this requires the prosecutor's office to make a reasonable effort to notify any victim of record of any motion that's filed to reduce the probationer's term at the midpoint. And then it defines reasonable effort as um, contacting the victim by first class mail at their last known address and telephone at their last known phone number. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm gonna scroll back to section two and talk about what happens um, once that motion is filed with the court and what the court's determination is. So here we have um, the, this is the section of law that directs the court um, to presumptively terminate a person's uh, probation term if the, the commissioner files a motion to discharge pursuant to that um, section three that we just went through. So um, that you see that language in B1. So upon the commissioner's motion to discharge, the sentencing court shall terminate the period. That's the presumptive termination and discharge the person at the midpoint of their probation term, unless two things, the prosecutor seeks a continuation of probation within 21 days of receipt of the commissioner's motion to discharge. And either, either one of the following factors is true. Either A, the court finds by a preponderance of the evidence that termination and discharge will present a risk to the victim or to the community, or the court find the both the first thing that has to happen is the, pro, the um, prosecutor has to seek a continuation, and the court finds by clear and convincing evidence, which is a, a higher standard of evidence, that the probationer is not substantially in compliance with those conditions of probation that are related to their rehabilitation or to victim and community safety. So you can see this is kind of a mirror reflection of what um, the eligibility criteria is for the commissioner when they're doing their review. So this is kind of a second check that the court is gonna take a look at this as well. And if the court finds that um, based on these standards of, of proof that um, either the, the victim or the community will not be protected if the probationer is discharged early or if the probationer is not actually substantially in compliance with those conditions, then um, the court can deny. And then you see here in the language in subdivision two, if the court does deny, grant the prosecutor's motion, deny the motion to discharge, it can continue probation for the full term um, as, it, as it stands or for any portion of that term. And then this next sentence says that the court, as a part of its, um, as a part of its um, looking at this case, reviewing this case, it also has to review the conditions of probation and remove any conditions that are no longer necessary for the remainder of the term. So Bryn, let me, I have a quick question myself. In um, sec, subsections A and B, that's, this is really like another layer, or a, a, like you said, a, a second check on what DOC is doing. Like DOC will recommend, uh, with this, this, this piece of legislation, DOC would recommend somebody to be, um, uh, their conditions of on parole be, what is it, terminated, rescinded? What is the right term? Right, it provides that their con their probation is discharged at the discharge. Mid okay, and right. so this is just like another safe another safety check, right? Another layer of protection. Yeah, that, it's one way you can process. look at it. Sure, because yeah. that language you can see that the language is really quite similar. The requirements are the same. That um, you're and it goes back to section one, which is laying out the policy for probation, which is to protect uh, the victims and the community, um, and also to make sure that an offender doesn't reoffend. And that's where the rehabilitative um, and risk reduction services and programming come into play. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, I see that um, Representative Morgan has a question as well. So why don't you go ahead, Michael? Okay, uh, maybe I, I'm not sure if I'm getting ahead of you, Brent, but I'm just looking at 2C. Am I getting ahead of you? That's right where I am, so. Okay, okay. So it talks about that and you, you speak ineligible for just do if they haven't paid that back. Right, so the idea is 
and you know, going back to what what um, we were just talking about the the policy of probation, what the point of probation is. Uh, yeah, according that, to the I, just, I guess I just I just kind of just missed that. Um, that's why I'm re-asking. Sorry, but I, no, no, I haven't I haven't gone through that part yet. That's, oh, okay, that's, okay, that's I an important. Saying. I couldn't yeah. tell if you'd actually address it or not because I was just oh. reading that and it, it made me scratch my head a little bit with what um, what would be the hammer, I guess, would be the term I would use to see that that is made whole or made good, I guess. It, right. The, are you talking about the restitution piece? Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Sub C provides that if a person hasn't um, completed paying their restitution or um, fees or surcharges, that that alone shall not make them ineligible for that early discharge. Um, and so I imagine you're going to hear from some witnesses about this. Um, there was some conversation in the Senate about it. Um, and I, the conversation in the Senate really came back to the idea that the, the, the purpose of, of probation is to protect victims and to reduce recidivism um, and not to keep people on supervision um, for failure, failure to pay. So um, there is there is a person can be held in, in contempt if they don't pay their restitution. There are um, by removing the supervision that doesn't remove all um, means of ensuring that a person pays their restitution. Hmm. I'm just not convinced that that may happen would be my concern. But all so right, Michael, Michael, yeah. what are, we, I know we're going to be discussing a lot more of that. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, we'll, we'll get into it deeper. I, I yeah. just, yep, got it. All right. Thank you. All right, thanks, Bryn. I'm going to let you okay. carry on. All right, so I'm going to um, skip section three since we looked at that already. Sorry about the jumping around here. Um, and go down to section four. So this is a report that's required by the Department of Corrections um, uh, this summer, beginning this summer, I'm sorry. Um, so starting on July 1st of this year, it requires the department to collect certain data about this um, point review process, um, requires them to collect data on the number of probation discharge or probation term reduction motions that are filed by DOC, um, keep track of the number of probation terms that were reduced or terminated as a part of this midpoint review process, mm -hmm. and keep track of the amount of time that's actually reduced from probation terms as a result of um, this presumptive mid probation term reduction um, by the court. And then they're required to report uh, to justice oversight in August of next year and the following year um, with the data that's been collected and any recommendations for further legislative action to improve the probation midpoint review process. And then lastly, um, there's a directive to the Sentencing Commission uh, during the 2021 legislative interim to review the probation statutes and also review the 2020 report of the Pew Charitable Trusts um, that found that states can shorten probation and protect public safety and to consider whether Vermont should limit the duration of probation terms for misdemeanor offenses to two years. Um, currently that we, we do not limit um, probation terms for misdemeanors to two years. And then it requires that in October of this year, the commission um, come back to Justice Oversight Committee with its recommendation on whether or not um, mid misdemeanor probation terms should be limited to two years. Okay. And then the effective date um, is July 1st of this year. Okay, well, thank you so much for doing this walkthrough with us. Um, I see in section five, we're, I think this afternoon, the committee's gonna hear from the council on state governments about the that re December, 2020 report. So just so the committee is aware that that's happening today. Um, so um, I, maybe we could, um, we have a few questions I see. I see representative Dolan has her hand up. Yeah, thanks. And um, I apologize if I missed this. Um, but just wondering if there's any piece in this that is around victim notification. Or I'm just thinking about our current bill, S18 with earned time. Um, and that is a piece of it, of making sure victims know upfront, like this is how it's all gonna play out. I don't think I heard any of that, but did I miss that? Is that a piece of this at all? It is, so it's in section three that um, the prosecutor's office is required 
to make a reasonable effort to notify victims of any motion that's filed um, for an early discharge, a midpoint review discharge. Um, the language is right here in subdivision three, and then it defines what um, reasonable effort means um, for the prosecutors. And that's once somebody's being reviewed, but it's not necessarily letting victims know at sentencing or in plea bargaining how probation could unfold. Right, so I think that the Senate, um, and you may hear this testimony, the Senate did hear testimony that that's happening, that um, prosecutors, when they're talking to victims about uh, the sentence, that um, they're talking about the midpoint review process and the possibility that a person could be discharged at that, at that uh, time. So I believe that that's happening. You will hear a testimony that that's happening. Um, okay, great, thanks. That's an important question. Karen, thank you for asking that one. Um, are there other questions that the committee has at this point? Uh, Representative Taylor. Uh, yes, another, probably another, well, I'm beginning to wander off the parts that were actually underlined, but um, I think my first question sticks with that. So uh, my understanding is that this, and, and this is a question more for Mr. Crook than, than um, Councillor Hare, the, uh, my understanding is that the midpoint review has not been heavily used or in the past, and this is kind of to bolster it up and get it to be used more. I'm wondering if there's any, um, if you see any problems with uh, the impact of that increased work or is, or is there that much increased work uh, on the, go ahead. No. Not for the department. Uh, so this was actually one of the recommendations that the department made around uh, looking at midpoint review and making it more of a presumptive process. Um, as with the certain processes, every county can be a little bit different how they view midpoint reviews. Um, our language we, that was a, the original midpoint review that this is replacing, um, uh, the department shall review, um, but there could be a lot of um, resistance upstream. So what this does, it, it makes it so that it really doesn't change the department's processes a whole lot. Uh, we review the case at the midpoint. We'll make the recommendations based on the criteria set. Where there's going to be a difference is it falls in the court and probably more the, the state's attorneys to look at the case and object and then find uh, based on the, the, the levels, uh, do they meet the criteria for the discharge? This is to make it more presumptive um, than what it currently is. Okay. Um, also, uh, the, in the section three, the condition of probation, and it pretty much lists them, and from my, my quick thing, it's may, it's, this is the limit. So the only ones can use for condition um, probation. Does that jive with your understanding of what can be used for conditions of probation, or are there any that need to be needed or taken away, or what? Um, sir, you broke up through the first chunk of your question, so I got every other word I got. So I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Her team okay, understating I'll... it, yeah, but I, I, we, I think we all missed you a little bit. Okay, but in the interest of time, I'll skip every other word, and that way you can fill it in. <laughs> no, no, I'm curious as to, uh, it lists the, in Section 3 the conditions of probation, and it says that it includes these. It doesn't say, and any others that you want to add. Do you think this list is comprehensive enough, or are there some that you think need to be added or taken away? With, with conditions of supervision are really, um, there's a lot of case law around conditions of supervision for probation uh, that have to meet certain uh, thresholds. They're really at the discretion of, of the court and generally done through plea agreements. Um, uh, so while there may be some standardized uh, language and, and a statute, it's, it's really uh, the conditions can be um, very tailor-made for the individuals and through the individual court processes. Um, so it's really, it's, that might be a better question for uh, Judge Gerson or the Matt Valerio um, or uh, John Campbell. Uh, okay. 
Good. Also, I would All just right. point okay. out that number 18 does provide that um, the court can require any other conditions that are reasonably related to the person's uh, rehabilitation. Ah, okay, there's the catch-all. Good, thank you. Well, Bryn, this is really helpful. And I think, I know I would encourage um, the committee, we're gonna be, this is the beginning. We're just beginning to dive in and take some time um, reading through this. And I know that we're probably gonna be, we'll have more questions and we'll be hearing um, some testimony this afternoon after we're off the floor. Um, but Bryn, maybe you could just give us another kind of overarching framing of this. When you say the stakeholders who were involved um, needed to come to an agreement, um, uh, or they didn't come to an agreement when we passed, um, I guess, Act 148, and this was a remaining piece. Can you just define in this, in, with this legislation, who those st stakeholders are from your perspective? Sure. So Dale can chime in because I think that they worked um, they they worked together during the crafting of S45 too. But my understanding is that it was the department and the state's attorneys and um, the defense, the defender general's office um, were the primary people who got together. And please, Dale, let me know if there and, were and I believe the victim attorney, rights people also. Yep, I believe the attorney general's office was there. I believe uh, Mr. Shear was there and. Um, I do believe there was input from, um, and I, uh, uh, Ferno from the victims uh, advocate, Chris Benno. Okay. Chris Benno. So there was a was a group um, that chimed in on this. The, the representing the victims, uh, the vic um... correct. Uh, and and most of their language is around the notification, mm -hmm. and then we had, and that's where the reasonable attempt to notify the victims. Um, of the record before an early discharge. Great. All right. Th th thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think if, if there aren't any other questions, I think um, I I'd like to wrap up because we have a bill on the floor and I want everybody to have lunch and, um, and people can uh, maybe take some time and read over, read over this. Um, and I know, I'm sure there'll be more questions. So, um, Unless there are other questions, I want to thank you, Bryn, for joining us. It's always lovely to have you in our virtual committee room. My pleasure. Thank you, committee. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bryn. All right. So I think we can, I think we can wrap up off on off of YouTube. We'll be back. Our depending on how long we're on the floor, um, we're scheduled to be back in here. I think it's at two thirty. Um, we'll, we'll be having um, some folks from the Council on State Governments. Um, uh, present the, their two um, documents that have been posted to our webpage that they'll be working through with us.